great pleasure for me as well as for the department to welcome Dr. Santa and Dr. Muni to this department and to the university. And they have, we are extremely happy that uh, they are here to deliver talks on two topics. And the first talk will be by Dr. Santa, Modern Geological Evidence Undermines the Chronology of Geological Geology Column. Followed by a talk by Dr. Muni on information, knowledge and life in 21st century. So before they start their talk, let me just my privilege and duty to introduce the speakers. And uh, Dr. Santa basically has a doc, uh, he did his doctorate and uh, is a, did his uh, masters from IIT Guwahati in mechanical engineering and did his PhD from IIT Kharagpur and he worked as an invited scientist in Korea Ocean Research Development Center from 2007 to 2008. He has published numerous technical papers in international national journals and conferences. And during his PhD, he made his spiritual master, his divine grace Sri Sila Bhakti Sarupa Damodara Maharaj Dr. T. D. Singh in IIT Kharagpur. And he thereby became inspired to carry out his future work on the most fundamental topics in sciences, origin of matter and life, origin of universe, consciousness. In the year 2011, he has received the Trinandi Sanyas initiation from Sirla Bhakti Nirmala Acharya Maharaj, the dear most disciple and successor of Srila Bhakti Sundar Govinda Devaswam Goswami Maharaj. And uh, this will be, this is uh, Dr. A brief introduction to Dr. Swami. And uh, to introduce Dr. Bhakti Muni, and he is a disciple of Srimad Bhakti Swarupa Dhamadwar Swami and Srimad Bhakti Mahadev Puri Maharaj. He did his PhD from IIT Kharagpur in Chemical Engineering and due to his pioneering work <coughs> of his spiritual masters in the field of origin in nature of life and matter and their desire, he is engaged in this important work of synthesis of science and religion for lasting peace and knowledge and happiness. So, I welcome the first speaker, Dr. Muni, to deliver his talk. Please. No problem. This is the that you want to try This one, right? Yeah. So, I would like to thank uh, Professor Tati, uh, head of the department of this uh, department, and all the faculty members, students. Uh, I am very happy and thankful for this kind of opportunity. Uh, recently, uh, we visited IIT BHU uh, and I gave a talk on the same topic on the modern geological evidence undermines the chronology of geology column. And you are all working on you know, similar topics in your department. So I hope it will create a good inquiry and a new direction to your thought process and research that you are carrying on. So our website uh, is on down, scienceandscientist.org slash Darwin. Uh, the title is Darwin Under Seas, where we publish uh, various articles uh, based on the frontier research in various fields, like uh, fossil evidences and also uh, genetic uh, data that we are collecting and also molecular biology and various you know, other fields. How that is you know, conforming uh, the ancient understanding of life and challenging the objective revolution which Darwin proposed. And not only us, and worldwide there is a big movement is going on. Various scientists and philosophers, they are working on this field. I am going to show you some of the institutes and their works also uh, you know, at the end of this presentation. Before starting, 
starting my talk, I would like to offer my prayers to my Divine Masters. Om Ajnana Miranda Sudhanjana Sataya Chakshur Mirita Meha Tasme Si Gurave Namaha Namo Vishnu Padaya Vishnu Prishtaya Vritale Sri Mate Bhakti Sarudha Madara Swamiti Namini Namo Sadabhakta Mane Manipur Dhavet Prabhupada Vashya Devani Pichar Mirata Ayati Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Atveja Gadara Shiva Sadeshi Kodhavakta Binda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 So my Guru Maharaj is the Bhakti Swami Tamadar Maharaj Dr. T.D. Singh is a PhD from University of California and he during his PhD met his spiritual master Srila A. Shikhti Lams and Prabhupada and Prabhupada was having a big movement that is on our Sanatana Dharma but what Prabhupada envisioned is that uh, none of uh, what you can say scientific community is giving much importance to the teachings of Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam. So when he met him, he told him, you young people from India came here to beg dollars. Uh, I came here to distribute the teachings of our you know, Indian tradition, uh, the wealth of our Indian tradition, wisdom of Indian tradition. And you people came to collect our bags some dollars. Uh, why not you distribute Indian wealth huh? in the scientific language? Uh, why not you establish these all things in scientific basis? So that was him, and he became a follower of him. And also, uh, his brother and <coughs> the director of our institute, Sipas Bhakti Mahalabhapuri Maharaj, is a very well known scientist, quantum chemist from America. So he also, and many other scientists, they come together and they started you know, working on these subjects under Srila Prabhupada and I met him, my Guru Maharaj, uh, in IIT Khadakpur. IIT Khadakpur was organizing one conference that is on aging and dying. We are all going towards old days, we are all going towards death. So according to modern biology, we are nothing but a combination of molecules, isn't it? The theory called abiogenesis, which explains first life came from some chance combination of chemicals and that gradually evolved into all the biodiversity that we are observing today. So, um, my Guru Maharaj was there, a uh, lot of scientists were there to know if a person is old, uh, he is no way useful to the society and a burden to the society. You have to take care of him, so much of medicines are needed, so much of attention is needed. Why you should do that thing for a chemical? You can do a simple chemical reaction, give an injection, which is called mercy killing or lethalistic which you can do that so that you can you reduce your burden, your responsibility towards that chemical you know, combination. So can you do that? That was the issue discussed in that conference and all the scientists, philosophers and various religionists came from various backgrounds. They all concluded that life is beyond chemicals. We cannot disrespect life. So that given an inspiration that we have so many subjects but none of them are studying about their own self. None of our subjects teaching about ourselves. Science ignores scientists. Engineering ignores engineer. For example, take this building. How it came? It doesn't came just combination of some uh, cement and bricks and this matter that we are talking about. Neither it came by some forces, gravity or some friction or some adhesive uh, adhe force. These are all not the cause of this building. What is the most important cause that we are missing is the thought or the mind of the architect which has produced this building and none of our theories addresses that. All the designs are coming from the uh, intelligent, uh, what you can say, designer's thought. Isn't it? Einstein's law, Charles' law, Boyle's law, all these laws are not written in the sky. These are all coming from the scientists. But somehow or other, we are not studying the source of the science. So that you know inspired me that I must make uh, you know some attempt to understand uh, scientist or the self, which is the cause of the science. So that made me shift into this type of new studies. And we are working in see Chaitanya Saraswati Math, our organization, our Acharya, Sila Bhakti Sundar Gopinath Goswami Maharaj, and Sila Bhakti Nirmal Acharya Maharaj, they are all about in groups. So today's talk. Uh, modern geological evidence undermines the chronology of geological column. 
So you might be knowing geology column, right? You might you might be studying all, all these things. I know it has an important role to play in evolution theory. Because when you try to study fossils uh, and you relate it to evolution, then I know the chronology plays a vital role from where you got the fossil, which you know depth, what depth you received the fossil, and all these things play a vital role. And I have uh, written an article, Science and Science Rock slash Sedimentation Rocks. You can find the whole paper. Uh, today I am going to discuss some of the issues that are coming up uh, in this field. So this is the brochure that you can see, designed by our present director, Sita Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj. Uh, and uh, he designed it to teach to some of the professors and students in Princeton University. He opened an institute just in front of Princeton University, Bhaktivinoda Institute of Spiritual Culture and Science. So one visiting professor was giving a talk that soon we are going to uh, discover or come up with a theory which is known as theory of everything. Have you ever heard about this? Theory of everything? Uh, they call theory of everything means somehow and other uh, there are four fundamental forces like uh, gravity, strong force, big force, electromagnetic force. If you devise an equation which can handle all these four forces in one single equation, they call it theory of everything. So, uh, to teach them that reality and equations are very far, our director made this brochure and he put some uh, blade of grass behind that brochure and he made a statement, all the science and all the scientists in the world together cannot make a single blade of grass. All the science and all the scientists in the world together cannot produce one blade of grass. Imagine. What grass is doing, our big laboratories cannot do that. Our cow is eating so much of grass. Uh, and grass is easily producing so much of grass. But our laboratories, purely based on physicochemical means, cannot produce one blade of grass. Why? What is the major challenge to that? Because every blade of grass has many, many living cells. And there is not a single evidence or instance where chemicals could produce one living cell. So, this uh, grass thing is very significant for our tradition. See Chaitanya Saraswatma, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu himself told, Trinadapi Suniche, no, we must be more humble than a blade of grass. Grass, if you put the leg on the grass, it goes down, and if you lift the feet again, it you know, stands up. But a devotee is very humble, like Prahlad Maharaj and all the devotees. So Mahaprabhu teach, you should be more humble than a blade of grass, giving honor to others. So uh, that's, that grass, what Mahaprabhu told, is challenging the whole scientists. One blade of grass we cannot synthesize in our laboratories. Even, the, we know the equation for photosynthesis. Isn't it? We know that. We are too proud of our equation. Use that equation in the laboratory and produce one blade of grass. They cannot do so. They cannot produce. We know what is the formula and how things are happening, all these things. But still, we cannot do what miracle a grass is doing. So, uh, Darwinists are struggling with the unscientific ideological approaches. This is the first point you must understand. Recently, we have a magazine called The Harmonizer, which we everyone send. And if you all can supply your emails, uh, we will send this magazine to your list. I think Sar received this month's copy to your health department. So, in this magazine, there are many you know, scientists and you know, philosophers. Uh, who are list our group members, Sadhu Sangha group, many IIT professors, AIMS doctors, and many many biologists from all over the world, they are members. So one uh, very famous biologist uh, written a statement recently, uh, challenging one of the, our paper, even Darwin recognized that geology provided least amount of evidence for evolution. Is it not surprising to listen to such statement? He said that geology is not important for evolution. Nowadays, biologists are coming up with such statement because uh, they have the evidence of genetics, you know, uh, genetic data. This is a geology is no longer important. Why they are saying this? Because the genetic data and the fossil data doesn't match. The tree that being constructed by Darwin doesn't match with the genetic tree that they mapped. 
based on the different uh, you know human genome project and they collected all the different you know genetic material of different organism that doesn't match so this is geology is not so important for evolution but the fact we must remember that last 150 years evolution is standing only on the basis of fossil evidence which is provided by geology we know it very well isn't it so nowadays scientists are coming up with such statement but uh, you, you can see still big magazines like Nature Science, they have do publish articles to support uh, evolution based on fossil record. Uh, 2013 article I have referred. That also published recently and that refers fossil record is the evidence for supporting Darwin. But biologists say we don't believe geologists. See, this is a contradiction. Uh, because their data is somehow in disagreement with what geologists are supplying. So that's why we say uh, this is like a, a fight between two different evidences. Uh, so that we don't accept geologists. This is the you know, stand that biologists are taking. So, importance of scientific understanding of breakdown of Darwinian biology is very, very important. Why Darwin is so important in all the scientific stream? Very, very important subject. Because we try to reduce everything to what? Mechanistic philosophy, you know, mechanistic reductionism. We want to reduce everything to smallest constitution of those you know, elements and then try to understand the things. Uh, reductionistic approach. So, uh, Darwinism is very important that we must understand whether it is correct or not for our research or all you know, scientific mentality that we are cultivating. This is a very important thing. So, uh, geologic chronology, you might be knowing, you know, you are the student of that. Uh, the sedimentary rocks, sedimentary rocks plays the vital role uh, in calculating the age of the, you know, what you can say, different fossils. Because you know, uh, there are two methods basically, prime methods that they use to date the fossil. You know what are the two main methods? One is uh, radio dating, another is static graphic. So, these two methods are the main methods. So, uh, these ages they provide based on these dating techniques. So, this chronology uh, and evolution are very closely related and the evidences are being supplied for last 150 years since Darwin you know, published the origin of species his book. So, uh, scientists claim that fundamental matter means the universe made up of what? They say that initially there is a big bang, uh, matter and matter were there, and then there is some annihilation, dark matter, they call about, and then big bang nucleosynthesis, how nucleus formed, and those nucleuses gradually, you know, produced all this complex in you know, a matter that we see around, and then gradually, you know, abiogenesis came, first life manifested, and biodiversity took place by uh, random mutation and natural so evolution is the term related to everything. They relate to matter evolution, life evolution, everything. So that is the you know fundamental idea. So how Darwin's theory developed? What is the history behind that? Actually, uh, naturalists uh, uh, wanted to understand the available fossil data and the present fossil, uh, present you know biodiversity. What is the relation? They found certain fossils. Uh, those type of organisms are not found, for example, dinosaurs, they are not found now. So, all these fossil records was creating some curiosity. Can we give some explanation, can we explain based on those fossil data, you know, some kind of relation, how this biodiversity manifested. That time, that thought was going on, actually. And we know that, you know, market competition was very high during Darwin's time. You know that? Uh, capitalists, they were you know, competing among each other. So this competition was the idea at that time. So Darwin tried to relate that actually at that time. And he thought, if somehow or other I can relate this fossil data and give some mechanism. Previously they were thinking evolution was there, but Darwin's success was he could propose a mechanism. What is the mechanism he proposed? There is There are some errors during replication during replication or during transfer of information, uh, reproductive process, when the you know, parent of spring information transfers, there is some errors and that errors will lead to some kind of changes 
and those changes gradually accumulated gradualism and that will produce a big kind of change a, first, a, a one species to another species species so and he given the idea of natural selection survival of the fittest that is the idea he taken from market actually market competition at that time the present time biologists they see everything is based on what computer technology we are going on right now uh, information plays informatics plays a very important role so in biology they give the value to the information at the present time uh, they are thinking natural selection is not not so much useful you understand now the natural selection don't have the explanation for how the new species arrive how novelty arrives means arrival of the fittest natural selection cannot explain only survival of the fittest it don't have any explanation how new uh, noble you know things arrive you see for example uh, a, a fish to a frog you see uh, during one cell zygote frog zygote or a fish zygote it grows and at the specific time certain genetic network that plays a vital role on development of eye or different organs of that particular species okay those networks and those genes are very unique for every species so uh, they found that a gradual explanation of uh, this theory what darwin thought is impossible that's why now they want to move to bioinformatics and many other fields that are coming up uh, systems biology and all those things ideas are coming up but darwin's time idea was competition so he given his theory based on that uh, survival of the fittest that idea came at that time so lemark was also proposing uh, his idea based on you know during lifetime organism acquires some characters and those characters can all also be inherited in you know for the generations Lemar's idea was a challenge to Darwin's thought, so he was very serious uh, in considering whether Lamarckism can be accepted in his time. So later on, Lamarckism was discarded in the early 20th century. But in recent time, they found again Lamarckian type of inheritance plays a vital role. You know, they they see epigenetic effects. You might be knowing in biology, epigenetics plays a vital role. Uh, not only genetic transformation but even bacteria virus and all these things they transfer information to our genetic you know material and that also expresses in our you know uh, processes biological processes so uh, darwin's theory was basically based on fossil evidences we know it very well darwin proposed whatever gaps are there in the fossil record future fossil record will fill those gaps that was the explanation darwin given it. in his time we were thinking fossil record is not complete future we will get lot of fossils and that will fill all the gaps that you know evolution theory needs to uh, what you can say come up with a profound theory or a scientific theory uh, so that was his idea at that time but uh, uh, as you know the uh, discovery is progressed now we know there are two types of evolution one is microevolution another is macroevolution Microevolution means there are small changes, isn't it? Uh, when you go to one country, you are acquainted with this area, or you go to other area, and your body doesn't feel so comfortable in that area. But after some time, you feel comfortable, right? So this adaptability is there in all the organisms. Organism can adapt actually. So there are some changes of uh, what you can say, length of the what you can say. leg size birds you know beaks colors of the mouth and so many other you know small small parameters that they say these are the changes that do do observe we do observe present time also every organism you see there are some changes you know some organisms in you know, same species it's you know different leg size are different and you know, different uh, features that we found within that species that is known as micro evolution those changes occur we find that some persons are tall some persons are short all those things we find in a family also isn't it those changes occur but what doesn't occur is the big change big change means bacteria to fish a bacteria never produces fish actually neither a fish produces frog the zygotes are unique they develop into that particular species only because those genetic networks are very unique 
So, uh, now in 2012, Kuhn, he published a paper called Dissecting Darwinism. It's a very famous paper. You all can read that. It is in all biologists. It's a very you know, interesting paper. All biologists are quoting this. You can, you can search it. I think nowadays, oh, like these journals, they're making it easily downloadable. You don't need uh, also you know, access to that. Because uh, uh, in USA, uh, which, uh, those, those journals which are having medical applications and biological applications, some of them, they are even paying some money to keep it open access. Before, when we were doing research, it was not the case. But now, recently, they introduced this type of system. So, you can, you can read it. It's openly available. Uh, dissecting Darwinism and this statement is in all fairness there is convincing evidence that a widely acknowledged uh, that is widely acknowledged that random mutation and natural adaptation or Darwinian evolution does occur within species leading to minor changes in areas such as big size, uh, skin pigmentation and antibiotic resistance. Some of these changes involve a simple biological survival advantage for a population without a mutation in the DNA, other might be influenced by a single uh, deletion or insertion within the DNA strand. So, after all this explanation, he says, new genes are difficult to evolve, the bacteria do not form into another species. The thing is that Darwin was explaining, we cannot show evolution right now because we need many, many generations. We need many, many generations. So, okay, uh, big organisms, they need long time to become matured and produce offsprings. But what scientists found, uh, microorganisms like bacteria, they are very easily in 6 hours, 24 hours become adult and you know, produce a lot of offsprings. So, you can test generation after generation those bacteria. And they are uh, also, a lot of mutations are observed in small organisms like microbes. So, but those bacteria never evolved into something new or something, you know, fish or some, you know, new species. Bacteria remain a bacteria actually. That's what the research is confirming. So, uh, the tree of, uh, tree of life, you might be knowing, Darwin proposed tree of life, right, which is based on fossil evidences. So, you know, one single ancestor, now that evolved into various, you know, biodiversity that we find. And that is explained through tree of life. But now the genetic forest idea came up. Tree of life is already removed. Darwin's tree of idea is already, already removed. Now they say it is genetic forest of life. Because what they found is organism is not isolated. For one organism to survive, it needs the help of many other organisms. Our human body itself, 90% of this body is made up of bacteria. You will be surprised. Your all the activities, your nervous system, your you know digestion, and your whole body is covered with a covering of bacteria. If they are not there, you will die soon. So this is the interesting finding that came up you know few years back. That whole human uh, body, you know, it is covered with 90% of the body is bacteria itself. So they say that if you wash your hand with some you know soaps that are available, and those bacteria are dying, so you will have nervous problems. <laughs> So there are so much search you know, studies are coming up. So they are very interdependent. They are exchanging information, genetic information. Uh, this is known as uh, particle cell. That's why they call it genetic forest. You cannot separate organism from the environment or one organism from other organism. They are all interlinked. So this is the new information that is coming up. And fossil record we know uh, is insufficient to support this new data which is coming up from genetic information. So what are the major problems with the fossil record? It is not complete. We hardly find uh, significant evidences for organism with soft body parts, like bacteria or earthworms and things like that. Very few fossils you will find. And to explain that we can express the whole biodiversity based on this fossil record is, uh, seems to be unscientific. That's why fossil record, you know, generally uh, in the year after Darwin, he advocates hope to find predictable progressions. Uh, in general, uh, these have not been found, yet the optimism has died hard and some prior fantasy has crept into textbooks. This is the statement by one of the famous scientists. 
uh, which is still quoted in all the you know, fossil record evidences. This is a very significant statement. And fossil record itself suffers from four major problems. Stasis, you might be knowing. Stasis, sudden appearance of the forms, sudden disappearance of the forms, relative absence of the transitional forms. These are the four defects. Stasis means for long, long time in the fossil record, we find the same organism doesn't change itself. For millions of years, that organism remain, you know, a, what you can say, fish remain, a fish, all through, you know, these years, we find it. This is only stasis, the problem only stasis. And uh, second problem is, uh, you know, there are so many, you know, details I'm not uh, explaining, <coughs> but you see, uh, Gaul is very famous in this, you know, field of fossil studies, especially stasis problem. And uh, he says, stasis, most species exhibit no directional change during their tenure on Earth. They appear in the fossil record looking much the same as when they disappear. Morphological change is usually limited and directionless. So this is the problem that we are facing in the fossil record. I am not you know, discussing the detail of that. In my paper I have discussed a lot of different you know, observations on different you know, ages, what are the different fossils and all those things are there. So, sudden disappearance of the form. If the species is easily, uh, what you can say, cooperating with the environment, the environment is suitable for it, why should it disappear all of a sudden? This is another problem that fossil record, you know, placing uh, and the Cambrian explosion is the, one of the famous examples that we know all the fossils, they appear simultaneously, all of a sudden. And this is a challenge to gradualistic idea which Darwin was proposing. Now they are, they are giving the idea of biological big bang based on these evidences that all the species they came simultaneously. This this uh, Cambrian explosion is the basis that there are many many species, many major species. They all came you know simultaneously and sudden disappearance of the form. You know sometimes you know some some species are there and all of a sudden you know they disappear from the fossil records. Like you know dinosaurs they disappeared you know, KT extinction. And many, many such cases, you know, you see, you know, 96% of the species died out. You know, in the whole species, you can say 96% disappeared without any much, you know, explained, you know, evidences that what evolutionary, uh, what you can say, uh, regions that 96% of the species disappeared. And how again all the species, you know, manifested. So many times it happened, not one time, two times, so many times. We know that primordial bombardments and so many other new concepts that are coming up, but still, based on evolution, gradualistic explanation of you know idea what Darwin proposed, these all evidences doesn't support that. And absent of transitional forms means one species to another species, there must be intermediate forms. Means what they do is they put uh, you know in between, you know, like laptop to calculator, they put some PC. But PC is already a complex system, right? What you have to show is the mechanism. Means if fish to frog, there is a change, it's a big change. How the change is going on? That change is not recorded in the fossil record. I mean, a fish becoming a frog, it's a big change. A monkey becoming a human, it's a big change. And not only what you can say uh, organisms, but so many other you know what you can say features that has to change, and those changes must be recorded, which they never observe. The mechanism being never recorded in the fossil record. Only fully what you can say formed species they placed. Oh, well, this species must be intermediate. That species must be intermediate. But what is the transition? How the transition took place? That transition is being not recorded in the fossil record. So. The two pillars of uh, you know geological chronology, which I I was thinking to discuss today, you know the you know carbon dating is one of the major dating system that they use for dating the fossil, uh, and next one is radioisotope dating. So carbon dating is uh, a problem in the sense its half life is only five thousand years, five thousand seven hundred years approximately. So you cannot go beyond fifty thousand years. And evolution needs millions of years, billions of years. Huh. So the carbon dating is not suitable. So uh, next, next uh, you know step is radioisotope dating. 
radioisotope dating, it cannot give a age directly to the fossil. In carbon dating, you can directly give age to the fossil because it is taking carbon, C12, C14, when it dies, you know, the ratio starts reducing. Alright? So, uh, the carbon dating, the assumption, major assumption is C12 to C14 ratio is constant over the period of millions of years. But that is not the case, we know. Why? Because, you know, so many industries came up and, you know, atom bombs being tested, industries will increase C12, right? And this atom testing and other like solar, you know, system cycles that also affect the, you know, radioactivity in carbon dating and also radioisotope dating, they found out. So, over the period of such a large length of time, how can you believe that C12 to C14 ratio is constant, you know, or remain a constant, you know, ratio? So, that is being challenged by many evidences. And uh, radioisotope dating, in that case, they found a specific uh, portion of the rock if it contains any radioisotope material and if they find that they try to give the age to that particular material and they assume that is the age also for the fossil so it itself is a challenging idea you see you, you uh, bury a uh, organism in the sediment but do you believe that sediment and that organism are the same age so this is, you know, scientists are discussing that we are not able to give a direct age to the uh, fossil in such case. And next thing is that, uh, that radio isotope converts itself into some stable product like lead in case of uranium. So we don't know how much lead was present when the rock, initially rocks, you know, formed. We don't know how much it was there. We only assume that it was not there or it was there this much amount. But we really don't know how much it was there. So, uh, radioisotopes also subjected to leak to the environment. They assume it a closed system. But, you know, many geological records, uh, especially, you know, USA geological record, they explain, in my paper I have given all the references for that, they explain that, you know, the uranium salts, they are soluble to the moisture. And the rocks are exposed to rain and moisture for millions of years. So, uh, famously, you know, in 1977, uh, this book, Science of Evolution, it is obvious that radiometric techniques may not be the absolute rating methods that are claimed to be. The uncertainties inherent in the radiometric ratings are disturbing to geologists and evolutionists. And in 1999, Science Magazine states, radiometric dating can no longer be called precisely clock-like because they find that you know this uh, rate of decay changes seasonally you know some some seasons it is very high some seasons it is very low the decay rate is assumed to be constant but it found that it itself changes based on solar cycles and you know many other you know parameters and uh, as far as uh, stratigraphy is concerned uh, it is based on uh, nicholas tenus famous you know assumptions that he had Principle of superposition, principle of continuity, <coughs> principle of original horizontality. You know that, right? You studied that. So, uh, I am going to show you uh, so one experiment that you know, one of the scientists recently conducted in Colorado State University. I will show you the video. So, I am going to discuss what are the problems. You see, uh, when the highest stratum formed, the stratum underneath it had already acquired the solid consistency. Means when the new layer starts forming, uh, below one is already solid. That's what the assumption that Steno had. And according to the uh, record of geology, 15 centimeter to 1 meter is considered a very thick in a rock. Uh, and then they found by drilling the seabed. Nowadays, you know, seabed drilling is a new technology. You know, they developed which you can drill even the deep seas for oils. So, they found that uh, there are sediments up to the depth of 400 to 800 meter. It's still rock not started forming actually. So, it challenges the you know, basic assumption what you know, Steno had. And no uh, sedimentary layer is extended globally all over the earth. So, the pure continuity what Steno explained is being discarded long back in 18th century itself. 
So this is what uh, is many other industry data and other challenges are there. Uh, and major major problem with stenosis idea is the sediment deposition occurs in fluid domain, isn't it? The sediments are depositing in not in air, it is depositing in fluid. And steno ignore fluid parameters. What is the effect of current? What is the effect of waves in the ocean? That steno theory doesn't discuss. It thinks that this water is still and sediments are keep on depositing. So uh, this scientist, Guy Ritter, he performed you know, famous experiments, which is known as you know, fundamental experiments in sedimentation in Colorado State University, and he has numerous papers in this you know, field in very you know, famous journals. So I'm going to show some of these experiments <coughs> so that you can feel, you know. Good. So you see. fascinating because they witness the past history of the Earth. Their study should unveil mysteries about their formation and the history of living species. The principal features of sedimentary rocks include distinct strata of relatively homogeneous material. Intermittent settling over very long periods of time figure among possible explanations of stratification. Internally, sedimentary rocks display microscale of stratification or lamination of relatively coarse and fine particles. Because sedimentary rocks form from settling of particles under water, it is instructive to study fundamental sedimentation patterns in the hydraulics laboratory. A mixture resulting from equal weights of coarse sands in black and fine sands in white is tested in the laboratory. Consider the motion of a sphere rolling on a horizontal surface. The radius of the sphere is R, the mass is M, the angular velocity omega, and the translation velocity V is equal to omega times R. The moment of inertia of the sphere is equal to two-fifths of the product of the mass M and the square of the radius. The kinetic energy of the motion is given by the following formula is equal to 7 tenths of the product of the mass times the square of the velocity. This formula shows that at a given velocity, the kinetic energy of a sphere increases with the mass. It shows that coarse particles have a higher kinetic energy than finer particles. This example illustrates that rolling coarse particles have more kinetic energy than small particles. The mobility of coarse particles in front of obstacles or surface perturbation therefore increases. Consider a homogeneous mixture of coarse particles in black and small well, particles. Can see that? When we set this mixture into motion, Small particles which have a lower kinetic energy fall between the coarse particles and deposit on the bottom of the moving layer. The coarse particles with higher kinetic energy roll on top of the fine bed of fine particles. Particle segregation occurs under lateral motion. Coarse black particles roll on fine particles when they have the same specific gravity. Submerged particles under hydraulic shear stress also display the same particle segregation characteristics. This is the experiment they did in the moving fluid. The so fundamental question does nature does nature produce repetitive segregation under a continuous supply of sediment? And what we found that it's just a mixture of different sediments. Are examined. It's not a you know different particles. Different fluid deposition different particles. Just a mixture. Let scientists believe that lamination is caused by periodic cycles of turbulence. When the same experiment is carried out in the air, the second can display all the features of lamination through repetitive segregation. This is in the air and well, even the steel the fluid and also in the pieces. The feeding rate of the sediment mixture. This is also the mechanical interaction. Lamination forms in the direction of motion here. An angle exceeding 30 degrees. 
given the absolute vacuum is at minus 29.92 inches of mercury. The hypothesis of turbulence is tested near complete vacuum at minus 22 inches of mercury. Lamination develops without the presence of a surrounding fluid. So you can see uh, in rocks different materials requires a different depth, right? Different Lamination therefore is right. They are all mixed up. Different particles are mixed together. Shapes. There is no kind of you know uh, unique particles representing a different depth. That is not found in steel fluid, in air, and in vacuum. Only when he will mix so, he done with the moving current, he find different particles are deposited at different depth. And that depends on the conditions in the direction of the fluid phase. During gradual degradation of the bed under plain bed conditions. So now you see, Here's the particles are depositing at different depths in the moving fluid. Large scale experiments on stratification were carried out at the Hydraulics Laboratory at the Colorado State University Engineering Research Center. For the experiments, a four foot wide pool measuring 60 foot long recirculates 1,000 cubic feet of water and 8 tons of a sand. This flume provides a continuous supply of coarse and fine sand particles under steady discharge conditions. The delta is comprised of three parts. The top set, the four set, and the bottom set slow. The time, initial time. It's showing the pattern of deposition. Over time, the coarse particles rolling on the bed slide down the four set slope of the delta and accumulate as the so delta particles are deposited at different you know, set. Direction. You know, when rivers is carrying the sediments in the ocean. So how the deposition occurs for different Micro particles swing. rolling on the bed settle and form a layer of primarily fine particles. The particles in suspension are carried through and deposit on the bottom set slope of the delta. After a certain time interval, we get a second so same pattern continues after certain time. So the, you can see uh, there is a layer formation, uh, you know, the fine one depositing at the bottom. The sediment on the bed from, the from time so this pattern to continue, continue to find time after time, time and you find you know, different particles deposited in the rock. Layer the sediment is the accumulation of sediment between the initial time T1 and the subsequent time T2. See, uh, he you know covered that in the video, and you can find this the same way as it is by the progresses in the downstream direction. <coughs> a close look at the top set slope in slow motion clearly shows a laminated deposit of finer particles. The thickness of the top set deposit. Isochromes correspond to the interface of the successive layer. It's not the same as not stronger. You can you can clearly imagine different particles are depositing at different depth. The thickness of strata is so various such experiments he did, and then you know he's showing you a cutting a cross section. You know, you can clearly see the different particles deposited at different cells. Mixtures carried out under steady flow and a continuous sediment supply. The cross section displays a clear superposition of strata of fine particles in white and coarse particles in black with clear lamination. Looking at the different colors given by different settings, and you can clearly see it to compute. And then it starts to from that to six. If no air gets to them, they now you see yeah, it. Now you see it. You look at it to even lose it. At different ecological levels, a heavy influx of sediment arrives, and they all get buried. Eventually, if no air gets to them, they could turn into fossils. Obviously, those buried in the top strata are the same age as those in the bottom strata. Because they are all buried simultaneously. In the 
disowning their sin, then another heavy layer of sin would arise, and more sea creatures are trapped. But what is more important is the ones at the top of the previous layer were buried before the one in the bottom of the bottom one in So the one at the top here is older than the one at the bottom. You understand? This is the research that you know, interests So, uh, this is the information that challenges the evolution theory because uh, Steno could not consider the fluid parameter and in fact in still fluid you will not find any stratification of different particles and different depth they are all intermixed together only when there is moving fluid you will find different particles deposit at different depth and what it shows that the deposition progresses in the direction of fluid flow so the chronology should be studied based on the direction of the growth of the sediments rather than considering the bottom one is the older one by considering a steady fluid area and the deposition is keep on going on and you know you find one layer forms then after a certain time second layer forms this type of idea being challenged by the experimental evidences sedimentation experiments so uh, now this mud uh, mud deposition which is a very interesting application because most of the sedimentary layers, you know, mud, mud deposition plays a vital role. Most of the sediments, the rocks, they form from this mud deposition actually. So, uh, one scientist, uh, he is doing a significant research in this area and he published many, many papers after uh, Bittal's work. Bittal initiated this type of sedimentary works. And then major science, many, many researches are on a similar line. They are you now published. For example, world's leading scientific journal Nature also published those two papers. The top one you can see uh, similar ex experimental works that Bittal initiated. And they also concluded the same thing what Bittal told that actually fluid parameters play the vital role when we want to consider the chronology of deposition of the sediments. So then uh, this uh, scientist uh, Cyber he also did the same type of experiments with the mud how mud deposition occurs. Generally, they consider mud deposition occurs because the bottom, it is just still fluid, no movement is there, and just, you know, mud is deposited. But what they found now, even at the high current, in high velocity, mud deposition occurs, and the pattern is completely different and more close to reality than what still, what you can say, uh, fluid could do, what pattern they can generate on the still fluid. So, uh, his uh, paper, recent paper states, possibly many may think, uh, this is a statement uh, was given by the, what you can say, father of petrography. Um, and possibly many may think that the deposition and consolidation of the fine grain mud must be a very simple matter and the results of little interest. However, when carefully studied, experimental it is soon found to be so complex a question and the results dependent on so many variable conditions that one might feel inclined to abandon the inquiry uh, where it is it not that so much of history of our rocks appears to be written in this language. So the mud deposition uh, depends on many many parameters. Still now the researchers they do uh, research on this mud deposition they use 32 variables. You know, 32 variables when we do experiments with 32 variables, it's highly complex system actually. You know, so many variations operating in various directions to account for it. So, um, uh, the researcher in this field uh, who published the paper in Science, he says, our observations do not support the notion that mod can only be deposited in quiet environments with only in intermediate uh, weak current instead. Uh, bad road transport of uh, mud and deposition occurs at current velocity that would also transport and deposit sand. This in turn will also uh, will most likely necessitate the revaluation of the sedimentary history of large portion of the geological record. He said that we need a revaluation. This is very recent paper in 2007. 2007 it published in Science and the same paper uh, being reviewed in the same issue by another researcher in the science. And he says 
the regions call for critical reappraisal of all mushroom previously interpreted as having been continually deposited on the stream. Water, such rocks are widely used to in, uh, infer past climates, ocean conditions, and orbital variation. So they say that we need a revaluation of the chronology that we have in geology. So um, the thing is that Steno's theory, if you purely apply without considering all these parameters, it actually uh, what I can say overestimates the age of the rocks. So we need to consider these new studies. And when we are you know, doing a, giving a aid based on you know, sedimentary rocks, then we have to consider all this new understanding that is coming up. So anthropocentric idea that uh, we can explain everything or we will be able to give all the answers is not correct. Actually. Planets are not under our control. Climate is not under our control. So we need some kind of humility in science. You know, science has some application, we all appreciate that, but don't go beyond its limit. Try to have some humility, that what is our, you know, limitation, how much we can study. Even we could not able to study one rock, all these years of study, we don't know what is its age. We are still, we are struggling with dating techniques actually. We don't know anything. And to claim the whole universe, we can give exploration about, that is, you know, very far, you know, what I can say, dream. First, let us develop some humility. We can use science for what? For good society, good civilization. Not that science can be used to develop our pride. This is not the purpose of science actually. Previously also there was science. And that science was theistic science. You see the archaeological you know, survey what they found. This much advanced you know, scientific methods are being used at the time also. But these are all based on respecting nature, soul and God. But present science, we disrespect nature, we disrespect everything, all living entities. And that is the cause of all the environmental pollution that we are seeing. In few years, only 200 years, and we see all humanity is being threatened. We have to buy water. In Brazil, even they are buying air. You see, how much degraded the environment is. Our food is modified. You eat that food, you get cancer. And you have no other option that you have to eat that food. How much horrible situation we are creating for ourselves. We need little humility to think properly that, you know, can this reductionistic approach give us a proper answer. Now, we can reduce organism to the smallest constant atoms and molecules, but from that molecules to produce an organism is impossible actually. So, we have to consider these parameters. What is the major flow to the, you know, Darwinism is that uh, they found out that every, what you can say, organism has unique genetic network. And those genetic networks, they are not the result of gradual development. Every species, they have unique genetic network. And they say they need some cognition to explain this phenomena of life. For example, a bacteria, they studied bacteria, it lives also in colony. And those bacteria, they, single bacteria, they commit suicide for the interest of the colony. They learn from the mistake. They cooperate, not only cooperate, they cooperate. So the, all these behaviors making them conclude the smallest cells are co cognitive entities. You search a paper, bacteria are small but not stupid. Abstract itself says by this famous biologist, the smallest cells are cognitive entities. So this is the same idea that Vedanta Vajino you know, explained. It is saying that life requires cognition at all levels. The same article is been written by the scientist Sepiro in his book, recent book, Evolution A View from 21st Century. Many, many experimental evidences he compiled together to establish that smallest cell. It needs cognition. In a, in a cell, data replication, you need proofread, error correction, all this mechanism. This is a cell has even mind. To do proofreading, it chemical reaction don't do proofreading. It just happens. But cell proofreads, whether it's correct, if it's not correct, it stops and cuts that portion and repairs it with the exact material. So this type of methods are going on. So our Vedanta was explaining consciousness is there than there is Atma. Previously science was telling there no consciousness. Now their evidence forced them to accept even smallest cells are cognitive entity. Recently one conference held in Cambridge University, you can search Francis Crick Memorial Conference. Stephen Hawking and all the big scientists and biologists signed a petition which is known as Cambridge Declaration. And in that they say, uh, human to amoeba, all non-human animals are cognitive entities. 
So, like sun is there, you know sun is there by what? His rays. So, Atma is there, Vedanta is explaining, by consciousness you can infer there is Atma. If there is no consciousness in the body, it is dead body. If there is no part of the body is conscious, it is dead body. So, this uh, consciousness was being denied in modern science and again it appeared in all the literature of biology. We are coming back to our Vedantic explanation, which is explaining based on Atma. Atma is immortality, it's, you know, bodies temporal, anabolism, metabolism, catabolism. But you people always think, everybody thinks that I want to live, I don't want to die, right? Everybody thinks, everybody wants to know, everybody wants to get happiness. Sat, Chit and Ananda. This is the nature that you have because you are soul. Soul's nature is this. Sat, Chit and Ananda. And uh, biodiversity in the Vedantic literature is explained based on consciousness. Different bodies, they are representing different consciousness. Darwin's theory don't explain why species like tiger has to appear, why a species like plant has to appear, why a species like man has to appear. Why? This why expression is not given in Darwinian evolution. Just it appeared. That's all. Some mutation of it appeared. But Vedanta explains because different consciousness are there. To accommodate that consciousness, different bodies are there. What type of consciousness is there? That type of body a soul obtains. Body is nothing but biological expression of the consciousness. Body is nothing but the biological expression of the consciousness. So our Vedanta explains there are 84 lakhs of species. And those species are representation of different different consciousness. So at the time of living body, what type of consciousness you leave the body, that type of body you have obtained in the next. This is the process that is being explained in Vedantic you know, theory. Our institute is not the only institute. There are several other institutes in all over the world. They are working on this type of field. It's a you know interesting field, harmony of science and religion. All the major universities, they are opening this type of branches. So India also should take some you know, initiative in this direction and uh, this is our book uh, which explains evolution based on consciousness. There are some of our literature you can have a look after the talk or my friend's talk uh, and this is the book I have been discussing about. Uh, James Shapiro is a world famous biologist working with Barbara McClinton, Nobel Prize winner. She got the uh, Nobel Prize for jumping genes. So this book uh, explains many many experimental evidences. Uh, which establishes cognition at the level of the cell. You cannot explain biology leaving aside cognition. This is our center in Sri Dham, uh, which is famously known as Jalen Mandir, in the temple in the middle of the you know, water. Uh, all different parts you find you know, in the water and center is our temple and you can visit and we are doing this type of studies uh, in our in institute. Many doctors, engineers, they are working on this type of subjects. Uh, you are all welcome and this is my contact details, my phone number and email. With this I would like to conclude. Uh, if you have some questions and shortly I would like to address, then I can give the talk. I think uh, from the name of everybody, you can ask questions. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a connection there, that side? Is there a connection there? Yeah. This is the charger. Yes. Can you turn it? Oh. Can you turn it? Oh. 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 Oh.
you can give at least half an hour. Let me let me do that. One more. Cell organism, the cell itself, the organism itself, 
and still higher are the multicellular organisms. So multicellular organisms are composed of large number of cells. Now, which idea is correct? Whether the bottom up is correct or top down is correct in this? So, it is possible to generate a cell the combination of elements in the predictable, the random combination. There is a question. That's how modern science is making and it's in a claim that first life arose from matter. Means in the beginning there was Big Bang, and after Big Bang, uh, for a large time period, there was no life. But the you know basic elements of this layer of that form, beryllium, hydrogen, all these atoms are formed. And then in galactical times, temporal line, you know, uh, years, range times, there were some chemical combinations, some catalytic processes, and then the first cell was formed. And once the first cell is formed, then comes the idea of evolution and leading to diversity of life. This is the Darwinian conception, and this is what is taught in most of the schools and textbooks. However, the practical evidence that we see at a practical level today is that which is given by another scientist, his name is Rudolf Virchow, that omnicellular a cellular. Every cell comes from a previously existing cell, isn't it? We have never seen that a cell is constructed out of material elements, like atoms and molecules. So, uh, since that is the only concept, so these are two contradicting views, and so we have to come to a proper conclusion. What is the logic of life? So, I think it is important to know what are the basic steps in the chemical evolution of life. So, there are only four steps in that. First is that um, there is thermodynamics. There is input of energy and then there is output of energy. There are steady states and there are unsteady state processes. Reversible and irreversible processes. So, these are all uh, the thermodynamics can you know, explain when there is a heat sink, heat source according to thermodynamic you know, force certain chemical phenomena are explained so that being the foundation next step will be autocatalysis because RNA molecule has a catalytic effect in the cell, isn't it? so, um, so therefore if you take the cell as a highly dynamic chemical reaction if that is the understanding then what is catalyzing that type of process? Because not only is that uh, a highly complex chemical reaction, but it has certain very uh, precise patterns. For example, this, this cell produces a new cell. That means uh, if you take a you know, chemical reaction as topology, topology means uh, that self repeating you know, patterns. Uh, when that phenomena has some kind of self repeating patterns, that's called a topology. So, therefore, when a cell uh, grows in size, let's say by thermodynamics, or when a conglomerate of matter grows in size or volume due to thermodynamics, then it may divide into two. So, can we explain the cell replication like that? That is one question. So, from that can the idea of autocatalysis, and from autocatalysis, next step is if somehow the cell envelope is formed, because the cell is a organized uh, structure, there is skin, membrane. It's an envelope structure, and there is a distinction between the inner surface, or inner you know, compartment of the cell, and the outer. Although there is information exchange. The next step will be evolution of life. If there is a single cell, can we talk about evolution of life in all its forms? So, some evidence is discussed by uh, from, you know, my colleague that there is, you know, uh, from the geological column, that fossil record has a uh, lot of problems. This type, these are all evidence already discussed, but I don't want to go to that line now. I just want to discuss something based on informatics. Because informatics, uh, what it means is that um, what is the secret of life? Because uh, in uh, modern science is analytical in its definition. Analytical in definition means try to make a complex process simpler. So what is the simplest explanation for a very complex process? So therefore, if there is cell or cellular process, what is the simplest and full explanation? So some people thought it was the genes, and after the discovery of the DNA structure in 1953, by Crick and Watson from the Nobel Prize, Crick strongly pushed the idea 
that the DNA is a signal of life, and we are very happy actually, just by discovering that. And, and on, on what basis uh, they claim that? Because here was a molecule which they supposed was faithfully transferred in the process of heredity from the parent to the child. So therefore, since this is supposed to be unchanged chromosomal structure, uh, it is transferred in the process of heredity, so therefore all the information must be in this molecule. So then the next question was, what is the logic of uh, DNA being a secret of life? How do you establish that? It was just a kind of a confirmation of a previous idea that something was transformed very faithfully. There is DNA molecule, it was already known earlier, but its structure was known in the three. So then Darwinism took a new form. Darwinism and natural selection after that took a new form. And that was known as New Darwinism. Um, so, so what, what is being said, that it is a very dangerous idea because uh, here it assumes that matter is the foundation without making a very deeper philosophical comprehension of the idea. It means without actually understanding or explaining the phenomena of life somehow as a philosophical guesswork or a philosophical, what is that, um, that is what this is, that um, uh, kind of reductionistic approach, so kind of a ad hoc supposition that somehow or other matter is the foundation and life can produce the material combinations. So from that time on, it was very difficult to discuss anything spiritual or religious as a scientific phenomenon. Then next. So I don't know, uh, are you having some background in biology, some of you? Not really. So I will try to you know, make it very simple. Generally I am making it for your biology background people this discussion. But since we are all living beings, we should have some summary idea of the thing. So there was something called central dogma. Central dogma is nothing but it implies that the DNA molecule is the foundation of life. But if what it means is that DNA, if it is changed somehow or other, then it will affect the form of life fundamentally. But if the DNA molecule was affected by the epigenetic or non-genomic factors or the extra genomic factors in the cellular process, then somehow DNA could not be made so fundamental as to be called the foundation of life. So something else uh, or something more complex was participating. So the basic idea is that Darwinian selection depends upon mutation. You must be knowing mutation, isn't it? What is the definition of mutation? Do you know what is mutation? Mutation means random changes in the genetic material. And how they are produced? As errors. They are produced as errors during the replication process. Isn't it? So they can be produced by some kind of X-ray effects or some kind of environmental you know, uh, adverse effects. <coughs> but if some a mutation occurs in the genetic structure, they are supposed to be permanent. They are not supposed to revert back to its original structure. <coughs> so that is called DNA fundamentalism or central dogma. But this idea was not shown to be experimentally correct in the later years. Even though the person who proposed it was a Nobel laureate, especially the work of Barbara McClintock for which she was Nobel Prize in 83, several other scientists have proven that, that there is a positioning effect means the cell can actively change its DNA uh, segments and according to the change of the segment, it takes a positional effect. So that means a particular segment in the DNA on its position has an effect on the cellular structures. So how that position is being changed is based upon extra genomic factors. So what it meant was that there is collapse of analytical logic in biology. Means you cannot explain biology simply as a combination of molecules. This is the 21st century status. And here is a very nice you know, paper, this is very nice actually, some of you may not understand it. But I would ask you to look at only the first equation and the last equation. If you see, there is a single direction information flow here, from DNA to the phenotype. The pointer is here. Yes. This one? No, no here. Yeah, in the class. Oh, in the class. So you see, this is the logic. Somehow DNA is controlling the entire morphology of the life process. Phenotype, you know what is phenotype? Phenotype means the morphology. You have two hands, two legs, eyes, hairs. 
So somehow the DNA is controlling them fundamentally. But what does the equation imply? It's a unidirectional error. But by 2010, uh, or actually even by 17, it started changing. And the equation looks more like you see there is a double direction error now here. Isn't it? Means the information flow is in both directions. This is the in summary, the idea. So I will discuss this shortly. But there was something called key of life. This idea was proposed by Darwin. What it meant was that the first cell was produced long, long ago, about 3.5 billion years ago. And then different life forms uh, emerged from that original life form. So therefore, if you trace out the, the genetic structure of those all life forms, you will find a continuity. Isn't it? That continuity will be represented as a tree. But that means there is a universal common ancestor. One ancestor is common to all. We do not know what it is. But that is a hypothesis. Whether it is an RNA or a DNA or what, who knows. So that was a medical idea. But the present idea is producing theory. The genome project is already you know, under, undergone for many species and then they did some you know, genome uh, with the, uh, comparisons of different species and they come to the conclusion that you cannot draw um, uh, what is that, uh, very uh, forcefully any universal common ancestors rather you find various you know, uh, different groups for different organisms in other words, it's a production of life. Not only that, the life forms are not uh, like any, uh, individually existing, but all life forms coexist together. Since one life form necessitates the, free, the existence of another life form. <coughs> Otherwise, uh, they don't exist uh, independently. Like for example, our human beings, as the example was there, the restaurant bacteria. If you make a, some special picture, you will find there is an aura, different type of light is there on the body. So that is because of special type of bacteria. So those bacteria are operating in the life functions. So then, that means that the human being cannot accept in its, cannot, uh, uh, cannot continue in its individuation. Rather, we have to consider all life forms simultaneously. That means it is a web of life. Rather than an individual life, we have to consider the web or interconnectedness of the uh, living. Uh, biosphere. So there was a very different idea today than what it was in, in those 1950s. And you know, this is a very interesting problem. Even you know, some of you may not know what it is. But I will try to explain you uh, based upon a very simple picture here. So this is one scientist. His name was Dreisch. He was a German. 1890s he did those experiments. And by 1967, he became a philosopher and was accepting the idea of soul, entelechy, all these concepts. Now what made him change the idea? Because before that there was some idea of preformation. They somehow thought the entire adult organism, if you don't understand, please ask me, okay? Because I am here, I am trying to make it as simple as possible. So they thought that somehow the entire adult organism is existing in a miniature form within the nucleus. That is called preformation theory. So when they were thinking, the mosaic theory, what they were thinking, when the cell starts from a single cell and then it, it, it becomes a blastomy, I mean blastomy means like it's a blast. The cells start you know, dividing very rapidly in the embryo stage, the beginning stage, blastular stage. So then one single becomes cell, becomes two cell, four cell, eight cell, the multiplication is very fast. So at that time, Somehow the nucleus gets disintegrated. That was the idea in those those days. That means by the time it becomes the adult, well organized structure, the nucleus is uh, disintegrated into two parts: the hereditary part and the uh, the part which is responsible for the uh, organization of the morphology. But what Drish did the experiment was this: he he did the experiment of another scientist called Rocks, and this is a frog. Uh, sorry, sea urchin, embryo. So you see, this is the embryo formation. So when uh, it becomes two cell, he cut one cell. Then what happens? It becomes half cell. Uh, I mean, if you cut it at the eight cell stage, it becomes four cell. 
half part is gone. At 16 Celsius, if you cut the if you go eight cell, half half is removed. So in the beginning we found a half embryo, but somehow suddenly the next day we found that embryo has become a smaller embryo and a smaller complete you know organism was formed, embryo was formed. So this was surprising. Why it was surprising was that at that time they were thinking uh, the body uh, it replicates not only by some kind of chemical reaction but there is a pattern to the formation of body. Means there is a directional pattern. Hand should be formed, limb should be formed, head should be formed, leg should be formed, and then there is you know axial symmetry also. The different of form of symmetry are there in the body. Axial symmetry, you know this. Uh, then there is the dorsal symmetry. This is the anterior portion, the annulus portion. <coughs> so there must be an overall symmetry in the organism, and we should show that up to a great uh, length of you know divisions, the last few stages. The entire organism to be obtained. So this disproved the earlier idea that somehow the organism exists in a molecular form within the uh, nucleus. So therefore, the pre-formation idea was discarded by the experiments of Rice. And Rice thought about the problem more deeply, and he did explain many other species. One more scientist was there. Uh, his name was Hans Spiemann. He got Nobel Prize in 1935 for discovery of organizing centers. So what it meant, what, what it meant was that the cells have some special type of potencies and they are responsible for <coughs> formation of further structures. And then uh, different organizing centers uh, possess different types of you know, potencies. So therefore, they concluded the secret of embryology is not merely in the nucleus, but it is in the cytoplasm. So therefore, the, there was a fundamental role of cytoplasm in embryology. But in, uh, in this uh, Darwinian theory of evolution, the fundamental importance went to the nucleus. So there is a contradiction there. So therefore, if you come back to this slide, as I was showing, they tried to combine this two ideas into the problem of evolution. Evolution means evolution, as understood in Darwinian conception and post Darwinian conception. <coughs> and Devo means development of biology, means embryology. Because you must explain. But how the problem is that the main problem that comes from this sort of you know, approach is that there is a problem of novelty. How do novel features arise? Suppose some bird has a beak, like the, the example of the galactical birds. So if one beak is there, it was more bigger beak or still bigger beak, it is not novel because it's already a beak. It just becomes big or small. But if somebody has, um, for example, suppose uh, somebody has no wings, some organism, how does the next stage will develop a wing? That will be novelty. So novelty is something discontinuous and something uh, which is um, which is um, new information, entirely a new concept within the organism, uh, concept of that particular species. So therefore, this becomes the major problem and there is no lot of dispute, lot of misunderstanding. Practically also evidences, social evidences does not support this. And really the question becomes how to talk about novelties in uh, evolutionary theory. So, so having introduced you some of the basic ideas, now I will take your attention to back to Aristotle. This is the picture of Aristotle and he uh, gave his concept more than 2000 years ago. And his idea was based upon the, this book called D Anima. Anima means something like life, animated, animation. Life, the living forms have animations. So therefore, the soul uh, was the thing of the first principle, and it was the first principle of living uh, uh, things. And it was the, uh, based on the archetypes. So this is a completely different type of concept about which we have no teachings in modern science, in modern books, just maybe passing references made, but it is not very well explained. But however, such ideas are again becoming important in the light of very advanced research in biology. And this is the idea of causality, because causality means cause and effect. Everything must have a cause, a reason, isn't it? Why does a cell become two cells? Why does a first cell become a well-developed organism? 
There must be some reason. Uh, so that is the principle of causality. Modern science, after the appearance of background, accepts only two uh, main layers of the, uh, causality, which I have mentioned here, one is the material cause, and the efficient cause. Material cause means the matter, like molecules, carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen. So that's what they say. Body is made up of what? Carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. And some trace minerals. That's what the dog is, isn't it? So that is, material, that is what they take as a material beings of life. Then, efficient cause means the forces, like here thermodynamics, or laws of gravity, or the mechanical forces, or the electrical forces, or the weak and strong nuclear forces. So, can we explain the entire reality from only efficient cause and material cause? And Aristotle gave this is just causality principle. You know, the simplest explanation, just think about this house. This house is very nice. Uh, wall is there, there is a roof there, ceiling is there, there is a foundation below, so many things are there. So, we could have said, oh, just there are some laws of gravity and there are some uh, bricks, some heavier bricks on the down, uh, lighter bricks on the top, and they are in a particular fashion, and there is the wall. <coughs> Do you think it is a very nice exploration and it can answer all the aspects of uh, what the wall is or the room is meant for? Suppose somebody uh, asked to ask you a question, Oh, there is a great wall of China. But why was great wall of China made? Can we answer simply from our knowledge of gravity and knowledge of matter? What question is unanswered there? Tell me. Why was the wall made for? Why was the wall made? Isn't it? The wall was made to protect China from invading Mongols, the, you know, the army of Chinese Khan. That's why, that's why the wall was made. But what is that uh, coming out from the laws of just physics and chemistry and the molecular beginnings of, of understanding, isn't it? And other aspect is that the mind of the engineer, which is having the blueprint of the entire wall structure, is also not explained simply by laws of gravity. But we can understand, therefore, uh, without uh, accepting these two, formal cause, something like mind, and final cause, which is the purpose. We cannot explain even material reality what to say, what to say of the more fundamental biological concepts. So therefore, the principle of probability in modern science is very uh, limited. You know, my Guru Maharaj, you know, Puri Maharaj gave two examples, very nice examples. There were some Greek gods. One was Sisyphus, other, other was Procustus. So what was Sisyphus' idea? He will throw the mountain. And he will take a big ball and he will roll the ball on top of the mountain. And when it was too heavy for him, out of some time the, he cannot do anything more and the ball will come down. Roll down, roll down, roll down. So, what of science is like that? Trying to explain what is life from all these various concepts, but after some time they are failing and this the whole structure is coming down. Again, they have to start with a new idea. And again, there is problem. Again, what is happening? You know, if you study the last history of the last 2000 years, it is the same history is repeating. And modern science again, the same questions are you know, being raised. For example, Saint George, the Nobel laureate, he said, Saint George, you know, he was very you know, diverse person. He had many different approaches. In, he was studied in biology, in physics, in chemistry, a lot of experimental sciences he did. But he says, uh, somehow in between, the life slipped from my fingers, and now in my old age, I am retracing my you know, steps. That means I am coming back. I am just trying to um, find a new, you know, basis for understanding what is life. So that was his conclusion. And the other example is of the Greek god Procrustes. So Procrustes was one, you know, Greek god. And what he was doing, he has an inn, and some guests come to his house, and he had a bed. And in night, when the guest is sleeping, so what he will go, he will just stress the man. If the man is short, he will stretch him to fit him into the bed. But if the man was long taller, he will cut his legs so that it will fit in the bed. So that so, so these two examples are very much fitting in this type of you know reductionistic or myopical view of you know, what is cause and effect in modern science. Because we are trying to fit uh, the reality to our conception. But really, we have to uh, become aligned, be in harmony with what reality is, just the opposite. 
So uh, that's why our idea is called the subjective evolution of consciousness. It is not that in different life forms we have to uh, forcefully fit them to our models of physics and chemistry. So Macklin talked about the Nobel Prize. Her idea was this. For me, the maze plan is my friend. I don't force the maze plan to fit my interest, to, to, to be fit into my ideas. I just observe her, I don't try to harm her, I try to become her friend, and then I can I can feel something about her, you know, the, the plant's behavior, and from that I make conclusions. And you will be surprised, Matrinta was considered to be like a mad woman for her entire life because she was proposing, oh no, 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 this that DNA centrism is not uh, the conclusion of life. And that was the central dogma that in fact he was proposed after the discovery of the double physics structure of uh, Watson and Crick. And they were calling her mad from the prison, but in ethically she got double place. So she was, and her idea was, you know, uh, you, you know, proven to be true in actual, you know, details of experiments that were to be, you know, produced in later days. And this is her, you know, comment. I don't know whether you can, you know, pay attention, but if you pay attention, you will see it is not a linear logic, but it is some logic that it is talking about. In the future, attention undoubtedly will be central to the general with greater appreciation of its significance as a highly sensitive and the cell that monitors genomic activities. So just see this much. Genome is a highly sensitive organ of the cell, isn't it? That's true. But the cell itself monitors the genomic activities. That means the genome controls the cell and the cell controls the genome. So the control is in uh, both directions. So you cannot reduce the cell to the genome. So like that Shapiro gave a comment, there are no genomic units of life. If I were to ask you what is the unit of length, what will be your answer? What is the unit of length in SI units? Meter. What is the unit of current? Ampere. Ampere. So if I ask you, what is the unit of life? Huh? Cell. 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 Yes, very good. Cell is the unit of life, that's true. But can we reduce it further? So you know, the molecule DNA, RNA, anything. If you take a DNA molecule in a petri dish and put so many chemicals all around it, whatever you think is the cause of life, do you expect it to produce a living symptom? No. So therefore, <coughs> my Guru Maharaj was traveling all over the world and he met several scientists, especially he met Gordon Arnold. He got the world prize for the PCR and he was telling that for him, the smallest functional unit of life is a functional cell. So the, the, fun, the most fundamental unit of life is a functional cell. And But he does not, he cannot say how <coughs> different organs came together. So, the direct evidence is that the cell comes from a previously existing cell. But we cannot say whether they, the different cell organs can combine together and produce a similar process. So therefore, he says, the other point he said was about, was about the mutations, that for him, he thinks mutations are not really errors, but somehow the cell is uh, fine-tuned for mutations. So therefore, the, the most significant idea is that today, mutants, mutations are no longer considered to be to just randomness, but rather the cell is somehow fine-tuned to even reshuffle its human structure to meet its you know, uh, demands. So, so anyway, I have I will not type more time from you because already a lot of time is gone. So I just try to make some simple conclusions. So we cannot make uh, the cell as a local phenomena, but rather the whole organism. Uh, uh, is uh, co-producing its functions. And there is sentience, there is consciousness. I will discuss one side about that. Uh, there is no Cartesian dualism, means there is no such thing that there is an information molecule and there is a another set of molecules which is carrying out that information. No, the DNA itself is a functional structure. DNA is participating in the functional activity of the cell. So therefore the whole cell is a one organic unit. So, natural genetic engineering, the same idea I have been discussing with you that the cell knows how to re engineer its um, you know, structures, cellular structures, <coughs> so they can generate structure. 
the role of epigenesis is important. Anyhow, so I don't want to go too much because so simple question. Can we say that water, ammonia, carbon, this methane and other small organisms and suddenly there is a life forms? So what 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 is missing is what happened in between. In this idea, this is the missing 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 domain. We are just saying from here to here, but we really do not know whether in between it is possible to explain it, this process. So therefore, we have different branches, philosophy, linguistic, anthropology, science, computer science, so many subjects are there, but what is the missing link? And which is called consciousness. Without consciousness, life cannot be explained. Anyway, let me go to the other slide. So here. So this analytical logic and structural logic. So from evidence, we cannot form the cell as some of parts. For example, there is an egg and there is a chicken. Which is first? Which can come first? Come first? <laughs> Isn't it? The cell is already complex, the, the egg is already complex, and the chicken is also complex. Can we reduce the cell, the egg, to smaller parts? Can we reduce the chicken to some smaller parts? No. So it remains a problem and it remains and, in, 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 and that is not only at the level of well developed organisms, but even within the, the the biomolecular functions, operations of the cell, itself such technology exists at all levels. For example, the metabolism first or the RNA world first. So the RNA world was supposed to be responsible because without RNA we don't have metabolism. So RNA, RNA has an automatic catalytic effect. But then, without metabolism, we cannot have RNA. So therefore, this is another same level of problem within the cell itself. So such logical problems are there in explaining the living phenomena. So therefore, uh, what we have to conclude is that only experimentally evident fact is the circular logic, not the analytical logic. Means we cannot specify where to begin with in life, in matter. Isn't it? That we cannot say that life begins from matter at all. We have no way to say that. So cognition is the life immediate existential concept. This chicken is conscious and the egg is it egg is egg the conscious or not? Tell me. What do you think? How can you say egg is conscious? What proof is there? See, the, this this was argued by Aristotle. Suppose you take a tree, it is actually in, in those countries, they have the example of oak tree, the acorn tree, acorn of the oak, the seed and the full tree. So when the acorn grows into the whole tree, the oak tree, it produces consciousness, isn't it? Now, what it means is that in a potential form, consciousness must be existing within the seed. Otherwise, how consciousness is expressed when it is grown up? So right from the beginning, consciousness must have been there in the potential form. But suppose, I want to crush that seed somehow very nicely. Then all the ingredients are there. So can I recombine them and hope to get consciousness by producing the whole tree? So this type of logic, that somehow we could have a seed or a tree, uh, and then we could have explained the uh, linear logic, is defective. And that's why I should talk about, talk about the archetypes. Means all these you know, different stages, seed, then the birth, uh, let's say the embryo, then the birth, then the, the growth process, the adult stage, the old age, and finally death. These are all stages in the development of life. We, also, we cannot isolate anything, any of these you know, elements. We have to consider the, the totality of the life itself means these changes and it is all a conscious process and consciousness is throughout the living process. So therefore, what was very important is the study of consciousness in life, which has been at our life, neglected in Darwinian conception and post Darwinian conception. The other genetic theory has been able to explain life logically, but rather as long as we the life, these genetic processes occur according to cognitive logic. There was Bohr's idea that life must be taken as an elementary fact. We cannot produce life as a matter of combination of molecules. So 
So there are many ideas. I don't want to you know, disturb you so much. I just wanted to uh, explain some simple things. So, so my topic was information and knowledge. So information is more like you know Sharon's concept, but information knowledge means it has a consciousness, more related to consciousness. So when we say some individuality is there in some kind of you know, machine, machine, no. But but in a living form there is an individuality, isn't it? I have individuality, you have individuality, my son has individuality, my friend has everyone has individuality. But this computer has no individuality. So therefore, these concepts, individuality, personality, consciousness, are uh, not to be found in informatic theories. But for to address them, because they are meaningful, you know, means they are meaningful. So therefore, we have to consider something like knowledge. Knowledge means knowing. My you know, Guru Maharaj gave a simple example. In that word knowledge or know, there is a no. No means negation. Like there is a process by which we acquire new information. Like I am here sitting and then suddenly something happens. So I must, you know, uh, adapt to that. I must, you know, uh, somehow for my you know, existence, I must somehow accept new information within my you know, conscious phenomena. But a machine will not do that. It will just collapse. Isn't it? So therefore, knowledge means even though there was no previously information existing there, but some new information comes and it is meaningfully utilized by the life process. So this is the extra element of life. So therefore, conventional evolution theory is very uh, random, but conventional evolution is a cognitive paradigm. Lot of shift has occurred in these two stages. Cell is no longer a blind walk, but the only activity is monitoring surveillance at all levels. The knowledge paradigm, meaningful, meaningless information is not sufficient for sufficient biology. I have I was discussing this for biology people. This is also very interesting, but I think it will be it will take some more time. But I just want to discuss a simple example. This is a very simple, uh, I think of interest to everybody. This is the process of seeing, this is the eye, and this is the image, the object, and the image forms on the, you know, the, object, the retina. So, according to Newtonian concept, it is just an electronic phenomenon, because here, it is just a uh, perturbation of electrons at this point. So, the modern theory of uh, vision, according to Newtonian concept, is just a phenomenon of uh, uh, electrons or they say at last it is in the electron. Now, uh, but, uh, there was another scientist who was contemporary of Newton and his name was Goethe. He was German, Goethe. And the German Prime Minister, even recently, was one year ago told, every German book must be something about Goethe in the original textbooks. So Goethe also, that the subject and the object are inseparable. But in Newton's idea, the subject and object are completely separable. Means, he, subject means who is who is uh, seeing that? Is a person seeing some object? Oh, is there some red, you know, uh, fruit kernels uh, are there? So who is seeing it? This, this person is seeing. I am seeing it, or you are seeing it. And what is being seen? The receipts are being seen, isn't it? But so that means here there is a subject and there is an object. So, if there was no, no personality, no subject, no consciousness, then can we say, oh, this seed is red in color? No. So that means it is a perception. Okay? But in modern science, there is no question of perception. There is only question of an electronic phenomenon. So, how come the persons come to the level of perception. This is a higher level of you know, conscious activity or actually it is a conscious activity itself and for which modern science is more understanding. So they say it is a question of mind. So suppose something is red. So how do we say something is red in modern science? Have you seen some problems they give in you know, physics? They say 
एक लाइट ऑफ सोलर फ्रीक्वेंसी एंड सोलर वेवलेंथ पर इंसिडेंट एंड देन दिस इज प्रॉब्लम व्हाई डोंट दे से रेड लाइट वाज इंसिडेंट बिकॉज़ देयर इज नो वे टू से दैट इन मॉडर्न साइंस व्हाट दे कैन से आर मेजरेबल पैरामीटर्स व्हिच इज लेंथ वेवलेंथ फ्रीक्वेंसी बट फ्रॉम 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 वेवलेंथ एंड फ्रीक्वेंसी हाउ डू वी सी द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ कलर रेडनेस और ब्लूनेस नॉट एक्सप्लेन lot of gap is there in between, between these two phenomena and these two you know tradition so therefore this is the defect in modern you know thinking that we are thinking the subject and the object are completely separable but it was argued since long uh, by aristotle and then later by goethe that subject and the object are inseparable so this one modern scientist yogi he says the term information does not mean knowledge although a message composed of a sequence of symbols may pass from knowledge to the receiver and the message so suppose i call you my phone machine records it as as a single sound voice like in morse code tap 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 something like this okay but the person who is sending he means something in behind those symbols and the person is trained in receiving those he interprets them as something but that interpretation is not there in the machine Law of science. Like suppose this is a red signal or a blue, a green signal. You are taking a car. You see red signal, a stop. You see green signal, continue. But where is? How do we explain that as, as a scientific phenomenon? Isn't it? Without personality, uh, does 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 green mean to to go on, or does red mean to stop in any scientific sense? It is a, it is a convention. It is a arbitrary convention adopted by human beings. So. throughout human you know conscious phenomena such symbolic logic is there such semantic effects are there it is completely left out of modern science so i conclude with this that rather modern science is more near uh, what vedas vyas gave and in more, more recent times what was given by kant aristotle and hegel mm-hmm. hegel is a german philosopher and our guru maharaj shila bhakti rakshak shila dev sai maharaj he said one thing about uh, hegel But Hegel was very good thing to happen in the Western world. Hegel's conceptions are very close to our Vedantic ideas. And my Guru Maharaj asked me specifically to study about him, his philosophy from Sri Madhuri Maharaj, because he was very trained by Sri Sri Bhakti Rakshakshmi Maharaj, and we feel very you know encouraged by this type of approach, a harmonious approach between science, philosophy, and religion. And I think you all can also. Makes a benefit in the last slide, and we can prove that the sentient order and the infinite order cannot be made the same. They are two distinct orders. And life is purposeful, meaningful, and involves consciousness. The holistic phenomena is not merely a sum of parts. So, therefore, we cannot explain life by beginning from matter. Life has to be explained by beginning from life alone. So, what it means is that. Our our proposal to the scientific community is this: that life comes from life. This is number one. And second is that matter also comes from life. In this way, we can harmonize and find the unity of science. And that is the religious conception. Thank you. There are some questions. We are both here. Now you got human form of life, 
your first inquiry should be am I who made this world? What's my relation with him? What is the purpose of human form of life? This is the purpose of education. Our education is not just you know made for earning some dollars or you know, some you know this paper notes. <laughs> you know Alexander the Great his story, you know, right? You know that? Anybody? Heard about it? Alexander the Great history. When he went into his you know, country, after winning many wars with a lot of wealth and fame, uh, with him, world's famous doctors <coughs> were there. They called all the famous doctors and told, when I will die, you big doctors, you know, make my body naked and carry on the stretcher with my two empty palms towards the sky in the slum area. He said, told, you are a big man, why we shall do like that with you? He told, because everybody must know I worked hard to only collect garbage, nothing to do with it. I worked hard, fight with so many people is competing to collect only garbage. Nothing will go with me. So much of garbage collected. So please think about it very seriously. And scientifically, not on scientifically. Scientifically, if you see what is explained in ancient scriptures, they are all scientific. You have to see a scientific look to that. They are not on scientific fellows in past. They are not so, should not be so arrogant huh? that we know everything and they were not knowing anything. This type of mentality being cultivated in present time, actually it is just opposite. You understand? Huh? They were well aware of all the problems, you know, what will happen if you are trying to see nature as a disconnection from man or, you know, individual organism disconnected from biodiversity. So this is what our message is. Any, any professor, any uh, teacher wants to say some comments, something? Sir, yes, sir. you just explained about the spirituality of life. So, I have uh, uh, one question that uh, uh, if this says about beginning of life is equal to, I have basically have two questions. Uh, uh, question. uh, beginning of life is equal to end of life. This is my one year's mm -hmm. end of life. Uh, and this, uh, my second question is beginning of life is equal to end of life plus something. And something is that uh, between the beginning of life and end of life. So which one uh, is correct or both are wrong? Beginning life is equal to end of life plus something. Uh, I have basically had two uh, questions in my mind. Uh, my one equation is beginning of life is equal to end of life. My second question is beginning of life is equal to end of life plus something. Something is that between beginning of life and end of life. No, which one is correct? The yes. correct understanding is given by Aristotle here. He says, just like there is a seed, it is growing and developing into fruit plant, tree, and there it is consciousness. So it is not that consciousness was not there in the beginning. Rather, consciousness was there from the very beginning throughout in a potential form. So there is a development of consciousness, the stage of consciousness. But in a potential form it exists at all times. So therefore the concept is this, if we try to reduce life to merely matter, we will never be able to solve the problem of life. So rather, as Vedanta says, Asadva Idam Adam Asi, our consciousness was there from the very beginning. So therefore, if we can study more deeply about its consciousness, then we can understand that multiple life is nothing but an expression of different stages of consciousness. This was our explanation. So that means we have to it's just like when like the death comes. Suppose there is a death, somebody is dying. So a doctor comes, he does a murder. So some people is coming and putting some light on the eye. And what he sees? that the, the people of the eye is directing or not. So if it is not uh, it is directed, if it is not constricting anymore, that means there are no other six signals, if we can lose our consciousness is gone. So what is that missing in life is consciousness at the time of death. The body problem the alive it is just a collection of molecules. But what I understand, he, I think he wanted to know that uh, this life is a double. Actually, life is right. continuous. Life continuous, is, yeah. Life is let, me, let me continue. Yeah. So, 
this is a part where the matter, when it, it gets interacted with the soil, then life comes. Okay? From birth to death, this is, a, this is a change of body. So in, during this period, after death, the same uh, soul or uh, uh, you can say take, uh, takes another uh, body. So he wanted to know that uh, is there anything which he or she or any electric person uh, accumulated during his past stage of life will be continued in the next yeah, That's what I am saying. You will see uh, a single cell zygote to the uh, baby, to the young body, to the old body. There is also uh, a change of substance of your body. For example, our director was you know, giving a talk in California in university. And we are, actually, we are also follower of Punarajan. Yeah, that's, okay. what, that's what I am explaining. We are taking some I'm explaining, I'm explaining or mask or not. Do you understand this? This explains that. Actually, if you see, he asked, can you say that you are body? Can you identify yourself as body? How many people among you believe that you are body? He said, oh yes, we are body. Then he said, if you accept your body, then you have to accept you are also rice, you are also dal, you are also chapati, you are also yes. fruits. Because uh, you see, your body started from one single cell cycle and it starts growing. And it's a flux. Uh, medical science says every seven years, all the chemical constituents of your body changes, renew, nothing old, including bones, teeth, everything. All the chemicals are renewed. So something is coming in. You are not rice. You are not dark. You are not chapati. But when you are taking that, that is constituting your body, and something going out in the form of stool, urine, and everything. Yeah, different, you know, processes. Anabolism, metabolism, catabolism, and process they are going on. So, here you can find every seven years, your whole body changed, but still you say, I was young and this many years back. So, which part of the body you can say, this is me, first thing, you cannot. Second thing is that, uh, there is mind, there is intelligence, there is ego, you cannot deny that. Even though you cannot see mind, but without mind you don't have anger, you don't have frustration, you don't have friendship, you don't have love, and all these feelings. For example, thinking. Without thinking, science will not manifest. But you cannot see the thinking or you cannot smell the thinking, you cannot taste the thinking. You cannot do anything empirically. So what Vedanta explains, there are 24 elements of matter. So there is a gross matter and there is a subtle matter. Gross matter is made up of Panchamahu, there is been earth, water, fire, air, ether that we all see. And then our, our sense with our senses. So beyond that, there is mind, intelligence, false ego. Okay. Uh, so this mind, intelligence, false ego is the continuity for the conditioned soul. Uh, after the death, only gross body is finished. But mind, intelligence, false ego not finished. And if that is finished, then you will attain the world of the soul. If it is finished. If it is not finished, then you get new body. That's what extra you are carrying. Yeah. This extra you are carrying. Yeah, that's what you are born. Yeah, this extra you are carrying, and that is your mind, intelligence, ego that represents your state of consciousness, material consciousness. So if you can melt both gross and subtle body consciousness, then you will attain your eternal home. That is spiritual level. That's what all the saintly persons or devotees that are practicing. How to transcend bodily consciousness, gross body and material body. This, you know, subtle body, gross and subtle. Both. So reincarnation is based on this continuity, subtle, subtle you know, body. That's what Bhagavad Gita explains at the time of living body, what consciousness you are in, that type of body you are there. You are thinking about sleep, you get big body. You are thinking about no, I mean, eating, you are getting big body. You are thinking about sleep, you get fighting body. Different different consciousness, Satvaraja, Tamo, that type of body you are being given to. This body you are representing is not different consciousness. You desire this type of thing. So you have been given that facilities to have that. But if you are desiring to solve the absolute, that, that plane will be also given to you. That's what it, the process says, that you practice these things in this human form of life, so that you will not again entangle in this cycle, repeated cycle. Only human can practice this. Others cannot do so. Sir, what is uh, that consciousness state uh, 
uh, at a uh, time of death to get uh, this human being life? Yes, actually, if you see, uh, human means rational, rationality. You know, when you have no inquiry higher than eating, sleeping, mating, and defending, then you get all this animalistic body. But you develop some higher inquiry for higher taste, you know, then you get this type of you know body where you can do higher you know region like schools, colleges, and all these you know different things that you find. You don't find in animal you know civilized. There is no such no such you know civilized because human has this ability to inquire you know all these things. But what is the highest inquiry? This is all being discussed. So there are four lakhs kind of human out of eighty four lakh species. Four lakhs kind of humans also do different inquiries. But what is the highest inquiry? So these things are there. of the department, I thank Dr. Shanta and Dr. Modi for presenting such an interesting uh, interdisciplinary aspects of aspected topics. Uh, I thank to them again also for coming to the department and uh, showed their interest to present this kind of topics in front of us. And I also thank to our students and our, our colleagues for their presence in listening topic absolutely uh, different uh, from our day-to-day -day lectures. Thank you again to all of you.